Hey everyone, good morning. Welcome to the Lookout live stream. Today is the 25th of August, and we're going to be looking at fires in northwestern California. We got some decent intel this morning. Uh, as we've been mentioning, that it's been tough for the infrared folks to keep up with all these fires, but uh, we got decent flight last night, and so we got some good intel to share. And we're just going to kind of jump right in. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, my name is Zeke Lunder. Uh, run this project called The Lookout. Um, I've been working in fire intelligence and fire mapping since uh, 1999 and no longer go out on fires, but um, still have to wake up in the morning and look at all the infrared and uh, got those habits. So um, glad you could join us this morning. And uh, we're going to just kind of start going through our stuff here. This is a heat satellite. It's called the GOAS satellite, GOAS 18. And this site's pretty great. Uh, so the weather satellites have gotten a lot better in the last um, decade. And this is what we call one kilometer resolution. And so it's... Um, shooting a shot every minute pretty much and pretty good resolution so this particular visualization looks at the infrared and so you can see this is yesterday um, yesterday afternoon going into the evening you can see that um, kind of in the clear air and kind of unsettled weather of the afternoon about noon the Smith River complex started to really perk up and um, I was concerned about that just because um, it was early in the day and oftentimes we talk about having a burning period where burning period usually means the peak of the day until the sun starts to go down and the humidity starts to come up. So, you know, right now the burning period can last till about 7 p.m. Starts Shadows get long and fires kind of start to lay down. So I was worried when I saw this fire really starting to take off yesterday around 2 that it had five hours of active burning potential ahead of it, but pretty quickly after that, so it's kind of real rapid buildup of pretty major thunderstorms. And so you can see that on this loop. Um, I'm just going to turn on my fancy, um, pointer if I can doesn't want to come up so um, anyway that brought some pretty widespread moisture and kind of knocked the fire down so let's just now we're gonna look at um, kind of overnight is a different kind of infrared visualization and um, I'll see if it moves for us but you can see here the the heat that's built and then the Lightning, I guess it's going to take a minute to load here. So this is overnight. So basically ending right now. And you can see the fire built yesterday. Then big cooling influence of the thunderstorms. And then this morning you can still see there's some scattered heat out there for sure. But you, know, you can see it just it really knocked it down. Got some pictures from... Um, Friends in Orleans of, you know, nice wet highways. Everyone stoked on the rain. Uh, the webcams around Crescent City were showing um, heavy precip in some areas. So it's not going to put these fires out, but it, it definitely, you know, every time we get a storm like this, it buys a couple days of reduced fire behavior. And you can see this morning uh, on the 199 corridor, 98% you know, humidity in Gasky, 97% upriver. 98% uh, down around Orleans and Happy Camp. So just nice lingering moisture from those thunderstorms. So, you know, as we've said a lot on here is these lightning busts and the people who live on the river know it is just like, this is a kind of a long haul and you get these kind of soothing rains and then you might get a week of warm weather and then the fire might just pick up with some strong east winds and spread 20 miles. So, you know, definitely the, the behavior like the Slater fire that took off last year in Happy Camp and ran, you know, it could have gone all the way to Crescent City if it hadn't hit old burn scars. Um, 
it's nice we get a respite like this. It doesn't mean that um, the danger is over, but it's definitely um, adds to the proportion of what we are going to call good fire. The effects we expect to see. You know, now that the fires are going to skunk around, um, we'll get a lot of good backing fire. We'll get some you know fuels reduction done by these fires. So jumping right into the Intel. I'm gonna take a break here. So I've been I've been editing these, I've been recording and editing them, and then I can just chop out the section where I need to take a drink of water or fix my map. So the live stream, one of the reasons I do these live streams is you know, by the time I edit the video, if I if I make a video that's an hour long, it takes me, you know, I got to review the entire thing. So it can take me an hour and a half to edit it. And then it takes me half an hour to get it uploaded to YouTube and everything. So going straight to live stream saves me two hours of work, basically. But the trade-off is that you all have to watch me uh, drink my water and uh, fiddle with my maps in real time. Anyway, that's the price, price for quick access. I was going to check a couple things here on the stream. All right, back to it. So let's jump right into Smith River. So like we saw yesterday on the on the heat satellite, there was quite a bit of active burning during the day. What we've got here is the yellow is kind of the estimated heat perimeter from the infrared. There was a lot of clouds over the fire last night when they flew it. And so the um, interpreter kind of had to you know, guess at some things and connect some dots. The, the eastern edge of the fire was less obscured. So not a lot of spread towards Gasky yesterday, uh, you know, maybe a quarter mile in some places. There was some firing out here that happened out here and I don't know exactly where. It's kind of heard some chatter that there was some firing to kind of square up this end. Um, I don't know where that happened. I don't know if that was up in here or out in here, but the white line is yesterday's um, perimeter and the yellow line is our kind of best guess, um, the infrared interpreter's best guess of where it was last night about midnight. So kind of steady growth in kind of closing this little pincher here that um, has got 199 up to Patrick Creek kind of in its in its claw. Um, also seen some some firing here. It looks like potentially um, this fire was carried out to this road system to try to kind of box us in. But you know it looks like this fire is going they're going to grow together likely. Uh, but whenever you see kind of a linear a long linear kind of feature, oftentimes that tells you that people were putting fire on the ground. Um, quite a bit of growth to the north end of the fire in some kind of scattered patches. So um, we're looking south here on 199. Uh, this is kind of the boundary of the scan, meaning that uh, they don't have a tile here for... They kind of collect this... Um, this scan information in strips and so that's probably not a straight line in reality just turning on the the heat satellite data it matches pretty well with what the interpreter saw and then this dot here was taken at um, about 10 p.m. so a little bit after that it was flown so we saw, what's that, maybe a half mile of growth um, out to the north towards O'Brien. Like we said yesterday um, and the day before, there's not a lot of great um, kind of control box options out in here. We'll jump, we'll look over at the ops map in a minute here to just look at like what the strategy might be on this north end of the fire. There's a different team at the state line that takes over and the reason that happens is because, like we said before, the teams that come in, the incident command teams, they work for the forest supervisor. And the forest 
boundary is at the state line. So rather than have a team that's in Gasky that's working for both the Rogue, Siskiyou, the Forest Supervisor, and the Six Rivers, they'd rather break it at the state line and have a different team take over. That definitely adds confusion and complexity, and these guys, these folks are trying to share resources across different Forest Service region, uh, different forest. Um, you know, whenever you hear unified command or you have multiple command teams on a fire, it's not ideal. Because no matter how well the teams work together, it still adds this, another layer of bureaucracy and just um, bureaucratic, yeah, just complexity, right? So I've never been on a fire that had multiple command teams that really like went well. Anyway, um, fire is kind of backing downhill here um, towards 199 also. Uh, definitely kind of scattered little bits and pockets. But um, one thing that's important that we've talked about on this other side of the fire is just that we've got the, um, the Slater fire here. So this blue area. So And just to orient you, uh, if you just jumped in, we're looking um, from the east over 199. Here's O'Brien. We're looking down towards Gasky, and we're looking at the northeast flank of the fire. And this fire is just kind of backing into Slater. Um, Slater burned here in 2020, so you got three-year-old burn. And we often expect to not see really aggressive fire behavior in three-year-old burned timber. Uh, there's a massive amount of fuels that were reduced by this fire. You can see where they held Slater here on this road system. So our concern definitely is just, we've got this area out here that um, hasn't had recent fire. and But as we've said over the days that, you know, having these big burn scars does create opportunity for, uh, you know, this This can become a lower priority for control just because we don't expect the fire to just crank through a three-year-old burn. Got to say that sometimes a three-year-old burn, it doesn't mean that everything in here got nuked in Slater. It just means that this was in the final perimeter of the fire. So it is important to recognize that these, this blue shape of Slater on here is not monolithic. Uh, so a little later, I'll pull up um, a satellite image here. We can look at kind of current vegetation conditions out in this section. Coming around the rest of the east side of the fire, um, wasn't really much growth shown on Hurdy Gurdy last night. And so we're going to come around here to the... Um, got the coon fire here which is um did show some growth yesterday and just to orient you now uh, north is at the top gasky's kind of right in the middle here and we're looking at the um the kelly fire so that's a little hard to see with um with this new perimeter data but basically the yellow is the perimeter we have kind of best guess from overnight and the red is where it was you know 24 hours prior and some things like this are kind of artifacts of the scanning you know but we just see there's some some scattered heat you know up to i don't know a quarter mile or so out and then the coon made a slope driven run up and over this ridge so we have our control box. I need to find that um, that we drew for um, for Smith. Here we go. This blue line is kind of um, a couple of days ago. We took the kind of control objectives and digitized them roughly off of the operations map. And so I wouldn't say this, this line is kind of a, um, it was kind of a guess. So got a little fire over here that hasn't crossed this road. So that blue line, it's not, um, it doesn't mean that it's kind of crossed their objective box. It means that, and this might be firing here in this road intersection where they're there. This is a strategic corner of the whole, you know, they, they kind of want to turn the corner here on this fire. And so this this might actually be where they put some fire on the ground to try to kind of burn out this this road corner as a foothold to build off of if they're going to try to hold Coon here on on this ridge system. Do so we had a request to go from uh, 
the coon fire out to big flat which i think is out here um give people a distance sorry so let me grab my tool here about five miles So when we say, you know, hey, you're five miles out from this fire, it's just, um, we always like to couch things like that in expected behavior of the fire. And you know, kind of the, the down and dirty rule of being a fire behavior analyst is, hey, if the fire did something yesterday and the conditions haven't changed, then the fire's probably gonna do the same thing today and tomorrow. So that's just to say that this fire ran three and a half miles down canyon with a, a kind of aligned wind in a matter of a few hours, um, a few days ago. Since then, we've gotten rain. But the rain um, just kind of, it doesn't affect the, the larger fuels. It's, it's kind of um, dampening the grass, dampening the light brush, dampening the ferns. But it's not really affecting the you know three or four inch diameter wood. So within a couple of days of warm weather, our fuel conditions are going to be materially really similar to what they were when the fires made these runs. So that's just to say that we know that given the fuel conditions in this area, that these fires do have the potential to run three and a half, four miles in an afternoon. So the fact that you're five miles away from the fire, you shouldn't think, well, the fire only spread half mile yesterday, so it's going to take 10 days to get here because it could get here in five hours with the right conditions. So we want people to keep that in mind, is just that we look at the fire behavior on the landscape, look at fires like Slater, and Slater did happen in drought with really strong, un uncommon east winds. But we saw that it did run like, you know, 20 miles in one burning period and killed a bunch of people and burned down a town. So um, that's to say that you may be five or six miles from this fire and in an evacuation warning or an evacuation order. And that's why, that's why is because these fires do have potential given the fuels, topography, history, everything else to make major runs. So that's about it on this fire. Um, we're not seeing any action yet as far as, um, you know, them pulling the trigger on big landscape scale firing operations. One of the things that happens with firing operations is oftentimes we don't, when we say we have to have a good window for firing, oftentimes we can't get stuff to burn well enough, right? So we could think like, okay, well, we just got a bunch of rain and so fuels are moist, so that might be a good time to go fire off this slope because it's not gonna be too intense. Well, the problem is we can't get it to burn, right? Like, bunch of wet grass and ferns we we could go out here with a blowtorch today right now this morning with the humidity at 99 percent we could pour 10,000 gallons of diesel on the slope and once that fuel burned off it, this would just go it'd go out and so oftentimes you know that's that's one of the kind of ironies of large-scale firefighting is that oftentimes we can't get our firing operations to carry until the conditions are such that we can't control them right so so it's a it's a it's a tough puzzle, you know. You you want to put fire on the ground, and and you know we need to fire over here to um, secure this edge. But right now, this morning, you go out there and fire, you probably wouldn't get it to carry at all. It'd probably just go out. And so, uh, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to wait and do it at four o'clock in the afternoon uh, when it's windy? Because that might be the only time you could actually get it to to carry, right? But then if you do that and you lose it. Then people are like, man, what are they doing firing in the heat of the afternoon? It's like, well, it's probably the only time. You know, we've got this funny window here where the fire is only really active for like, you know, four or five hours a day. And so, you know, sun goes down and your firing operation gets really hard to carry sometimes. So, you know, we saw that last year on the Mosquito was the fire moved into a like a seven-year-old, eight-year-old burn that was full of green ceanothus. And they just and it was under a heavy inversion. They just couldn't get it to burn. And the same in the Dixie fire, when the fire was burning up by um, the Hat Creek Rim, in an other recent burn, they just the firing operations. It can be really hard to get you know eight year old green brush to burn until the wind's blowing and it's dry and hot. So when I say that you know firing is one of the main tools we have 
to contain these large fires, it's hard to find the window where you can put fire on the ground, get it to carry, get it to consume as well as you want. Because if you just put a bunch of fire on the ground and you get it kind of black, then it's, when the wind starts blowing and it gets dry again, and then it just, then it can burn again, right? So like on the Dixie fire, we fired, uh, not me, but the organization, uh, firefighters, fired Humboldt Road. And it was this nice, thin, kind of white fir forest. Fuel brakes, really kind of textbook, this is what a fuel brake should look like. But we had this heavy inversion, almost rain, basically, cool temperatures. Uh, they ran around, they, they fired that whole road system, probably 20 miles of firing, but it didn't burn black enough. And then um, when the inversion lifted a week later, um, fires deeper in just spotted over all over the place there. So burning out's difficult, and oftentimes you just don't get the window, and then the lid comes off the pot, the fire spices up, it comes running out of here, and you just didn't get the opportunity. Okay, so we got some, we did get good IR on most of the Six Rivers complex. So we're gonna come down and look at Bluff Creek, or Blue Creek 2 fire. This is burning mainly in the wilderness. It's been largely unstaffed. Um, and you can see this fire kind of um, spotted and made a slope driven run up, I think this is the Go Road. So here we're kind of between um, Wichapec and Gasky out in the Siski Wilderness. Wilderness boundary here in green. So this fire has been a low priority just because it's in the middle of nowhere. And it's active, it's up high, it's kind of contained in a lot of ways by high country and other burn scars. A lot of this area burned in, um, sorry, 2008. Okay, hopping out here down to the Mosquito and Bluff 2 fire. Um, these fires have had, they've gotten more resources over the last few days. Um, here at the Wilderness Boundary, um, this road forms the Wilderness Boundary. And... We've been watching here, yesterday we were watching a, a kind of a firing operation that was happening here. And this is the bluff fire. And yesterday um, we saw there was some firing out along this road system and we thought that it would probably continue overnight, and it did, they carried fire. You can see this is a firing operation up around this road system, and then you can see there's a little boo-boo um, where the fire is on the wrong side of the line, and that happens, and it's in the wilderness now. Over here, um, this looks like a firing operation, like potentially there's some hand line or an old road here that got opened up. No, uh, maybe not. Hard to tell what's going on there. We'll pull up the ops map in a minute. Um, anyway, this fire, you can see, made some slope driven runs yesterday. This is the Bluff 2 fire. An interesting thing with a slope driven run and wind driven run is, you know, down canyon winds can blow the fire down the canyon, up canyon winds can blow it up the canyon. Anytime you've got wind blowing up a slope, we you know we, we call that alignment, and that's when fires like to, to run. Um, over here, it looks like there's this is um, this is likely a firing operation. The way this is coming down here. Okay, and then mosquito, mosquito has also been kind of um, they've been kind of trying to herd it between the roads here. And so we've been watching over the last few days as they've kind of carried fire out to the roads. And that looks like it's worked pretty well on the west, on the east side of the fire. Uh, we saw yesterday it did kind of push up and out um, across the creek here. And, um, and we thought it might. And so there's a spot up the hill from there. 
So, and as we've been saying, mid slope roads are tough, tough places to hold fire. And oftentimes it's, you know, it's what you've got to work with, especially in the Klamath. But it's really hard when you have a fire run up to a road to have it not spot over. And this ground is so steep that once one is, you know, it's dangerous to deploy people on a mid slope road with fire below. And two, once the fire is over the road, it's really tough to catch it if you don't have helicopters um, to help you out. And with the smoke that we have had a lot of the time in here, uh, it's tough to get aviation assets. And also the aviation priority is near the towns like Orleans. So that's Mosquito. Um, can jump over here to the Lost Fire. Lost is still showing a lot of heat, um, scattered heat, and that's because it's burning in timber and the heat lingers for a long time. We've been watching um, the firing along kind of the roads here, and it's showing a little spot out here, but that isn't showing any new growth in the last 24 hours. So still some you know scattered movement on Lost. Um, let's see here. These orange blobs are kind of in intense heat and then the yellow is the scattered and usually what yellow means is okay it burned a while ago and it's cooling down now okay so we're gonna other fire we got here is lone pine uh lone pine's burning right by hoopa and that really hasn't done much. The infrared isn't showing a lot of heat there. There's scattered heat in the interior. This kind of flank around, um, so we're, we're, you know, Willow Creek is down here. Hoopa's up here. And um, this fire hasn't really done much. And uh, we've been feeling for a few days like that. Lone Pine was pretty well wrapped. Okay, flying up to Orleans. Uh, definitely this is one of the ones that we've been watching. Uh, the perch fire perch they did get some rain yesterday afternoon knock things down a bit so we've got some uh, intense heat coming down this ridge with scattered heat below it and some heat down here sorry i'll we'll go north up here so here's orleans this is um perch creek as we've been saying there's a bunch of folks living at the bottom of perch creek and a lot of those folks have been kind of mutual aid style out doing a lot with chipper, uh, lots of saw work. So perch, um, this squirted up here a couple of days ago and when the scan isn't showing any new heat on the south side of Perch Creek. We're just gonna kind of take the, uh, the view from Orleans here. So when I see this scattered, or this like line of intense heat, that looks to me like a firing operation, like they're trying to bring fire down this ridge. So we're gonna jump over to um, our ops map if we can find which one that is well, we're going to have to queue that up I guess I don't think I have the perch um, ops map sorry but like I said this looks like a firing operation to me you usually don't see like the fire squirt straight down a ridge by itself um, I know the locals you know um there's been concern there just about how things are going to get lit, but um, no, there's been pretty good coordination between the team and the locals, and that's a result of years and years of um, conflict and a lot of hard work by a lot of people to you know figure out how how we can communicate better um, during these disasters. Coming over um, to the ridge here on uh, Soames Mountain. Uh, we do have heat that is over the ridge. Sorry, it's kind of a weird perspective. Kind of from the get-go, we haven't expected this fire to be held on this ridge. It's just, um, it's really rare that that has worked in the past. Uh, I'm going to pull up some overlays here from uh, Ryan Stevens. So the Soames fire 2006 was not held on this ridge. Um, Butler fire was in part because it burned into a seven year old burn scar, right? And you can see like, sorry there. 
you can see with Butler, they fired this ridge and then they had a donut here because they couldn't get it to carry. So we talk about that with firing operations. Like sometimes you do a firing operation and the, never, the other fire never gets there. The fire, in this case, held up at the creek. Anyway, things are going about as well as could be expected on perch. You know, we expected from the get-go that that fire um, would likely burn out to at least the footprint of the Somes. You know, that it'll likely burn this 96 up to the Salmon River Road and then up to Butler Flat. So uh, rain's good. Um, if they get some, uh, you know, if they get this um, ridge tied in, that buys an element of control. Um keeping it out of here but likely you know it's it's not unlikely that other parts of this fire are going to back down into here don't really have enough intel on the ground there to have an opinion on it um but we're hoping you know if you're if you're up there working on this um or if you're in orleans and uh you know have a perspective on um uh, how things are going and communications between the team and the locals. Um, I'd love to hear from you. One thing that popped up um, that I hadn't seen yet and doesn't have a name on the maps um, is a new fire here or a fire that we haven't been following in Woolly Creek. So here's Sums Bar and going up the Klamath or going up the Salmon, Woolly Creek is this big major drainage that drains the south side of the Marble Mountain Wilderness. And this fire is growing and it's kind of spread steadily. And it's kind of in a little donut hole uh, of the Macash fire. So the Macash is in blue here, burned in 2021. And so uh, this fire's got nowhere to go on three sides, but on the um, south side, some of that area hasn't burned for a while. Uh, let's see. Here. Da, 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 da. Like these, these tan colors are kind of you start to get a little older, 2006, um, 2017 wallow fire. So it's kind of wrapped by like six year old burn. Some of these areas over here in the Salmon River burned, you know, four or five, six times in the past century. So it's going to fill in potentially this puzzle piece here, but it's got kind of low potential for um, really growing up to, to be a big fire. You know, Mike scored out here through this 2006 Hancock fire. Um, but it's got limited potential to kind of spread um, out to the east. Okay, we're heading up river to um, Cottage Grove here between uh, Happy Camp and Soames Bar where the Elliott Canyon Swillip kind of puzzle unfolds and so many layers. Um, Okay. Um, Canyon and Elliot have grown together here. We've talked for a few days about um, how Canyon had the potential to head out west here. We're looking west up into the Siskiyou Wilderness. And so many layers. Siskiyou Wilderness is up on top along with like the blue and the bluff, the blue, the blue fire that we talked about really kind of being unstaffed. So as far as continuing to spread, there's not a big box kind of control strategy just because of where it is. It has crossed um, Dillon Creek a little bit, according to the IR. Uh, we've just been kind of watching this one grow slowly up Canyon. So the yellow areas and orange areas here are new growth on the fire. It's interesting just, you know, that you see these patches where there's just no heat. And that's kind of a function of the rain we've gotten and uh, the matrix of fuels from past fires. Swill up here um, grew a little down canyon, grew a little up canyon. Some of this uh, looks like it could be a little firing. Uh, we'll get in a little closer there. One thing that's interesting in this canyon country um, from a fire behavior standpoint is you've got kind of this, what we call diurnal winds. So... We're looking up canyon here and you get up canyon winds every afternoon. And so this 
hot spot here on the landscape last night. When we get our strong up canyon winds in the afternoon, it's going to be a line to blow up this slope. And then you get strong down canyon winds at night. So kind of at any given time, you got a portion of the fire, a portion of the landscape that's in alignment. So, you know, if you're looking down the canyon with the down canyon winds, this fire here, um, if it gets across the creek, then can be aligned to be blowing up this slope at night by the down canyon winds. What it also means, though, is at any given time, 50% of the landscape is not in alignment. So uh, if you've got down canyon winds at night, the up canyon facing, the, the down canyon facing slopes are kind of in the lee side of that. And so you get this kind of mosaic on the landscape of uh, burned and unburned. So you really see that in the Feather River Canyon. You see that in the Trinity River Canyon. Anytime you're driving in one of these canyons, start looking for these kind of patterns where you see kind of these like little scorch, like maybe you see 100 acres of scorched forest on the slope that points up canyon. You're like, oh, that burned at night. And then you see the same thing on the slope that faces down canyon. It's like, oh, that burned in the afternoon. It was up canyon. So just that complexity of wind and slope and everything creates is part of what creates the mosaic of vegetation that you see in canyons. And it helps us during big fires in canyons. It, it's oftentimes we don't roast the entire landscape all at once. We get these, you know, we get these patches that survive just because they were out of the wind when the fire happened to be there. So we do have that alignment here of the upslope where we have the potential kind of for this um, Elliot to continue to spread up towards Swillip. And the fire history here is... Um, like this is burning in a pocket that doesn't have recent fire history. So we wouldn't be surprised to see this fill in during this, uh, you know, if we get some dry weather now for a while. You fish here um, continues to back. It's really taking its time. You can see the, the intense heat on the edges and kind of the scattered heat where it's cooling down. And it's just slowly chunking its way out to fill in this gap in the landscape. As we mentioned before, that's inside the um, the Macash footprint. Or it's surrounded by the Macash footprint, sorry. So, um, you got Macash out here, 2021. And we got Fireline kind of, they've built a box now from Happy Camp up this way that kind of boxes in the U-Fish into kind of We'll, we'll jump to the ops map here. Malone, um, not a lot of growth on Malone. Um, but some, and some artifacts here on the um, infrared from the you know from the plane from the way the scanner works. And in this deep country, you can get some kind of weird things on these scans. The interpreter's job basically is take raw data from the infrared scanner and try to get rid of all this crap that's kind of introduced by weird angles. And the plane was, you know, to the west, and so the fire looked like it was farther east because you're looking kind of down this slope. And so interpreters don't have an easy job, um, and especially when there's all these fires going on, the interpreter had to, you know, jam through, you know, ten different fires and still get us this stuff in time for us to not complain about it uh, when we don't have it on our desktop at six in the morning. So just jumping now over to um, the map. We've got Ufish here. Um, you can see there's no line directly around Ufish, but you can see that um, this dozer line we talked about coming up from Happy Camp. Um, prepped roads, historic dozer line. It's kind of in its box already. And then we've got um, over here on Malone, we've got road and hand line that's prepped on the north side. And we've got road and new dozer line kind of down on the south side. So, and then Elk Creek runs up the bottom here. Sorry for this kind of jumpy graphics. It's, uh, okay, here's Swillip. Uh, Swillip's got some prepped road that's got dozer line to box it in.
but on the south side where um where we see this aligned run potentially going up there's some dozer line there and some hand line um this whole drainage there's nothing really uh, there's no lines right now on showing on the ops map for the kind of west side of swillip uh, i think it probably is a foregone conclusion that swillip and elliot are going to merge that that they probably won't be able to hold this flank and that especially with the kind of up canyon winds coming up in the middle here that these fires will merge here's the rest of elliot um as we said before there's not really a lot of control strategy on elliot there's a uh, planned hand line down this ridge and opening up this old dozer line like we've said you know maybe this this rain it could buy a week you know um, of time for old lines to get opened up hand lines to get put in they do have a lot of resources on these fires now so when you do get a rainstorm comes and knocks things down you do get window of opportunity so it might happen um, but it might not matter if they can't get this line in and fired and mopped up before we get our week of dry weather or our east winds all right so and as we said before here's happy camp we've got the uh, 2017 oak fire here that kind of wraps this whole flank of these these fires and then um we've got slater in the play there too like all of happy camp all around happy camp got burned in slater slater's this dark blue so right now there's not a lot of threat by any of these fires to happy camp just because happy happy camp pretty much got burned to the ground two years ago and either there's not houses there to burn or there's a recent burn I think it doesn't make the smoke any less uh, miserable or traumatic for folks in happy camp, but um, there are benefits to living in a recently, there aren't many benefits to living in a recently burned landscape, but one of them is that you have to worry less about getting cooked again right away. So uh, not trying to make a joke at anyone's expense. It's just the way that these things work. Um, okay. We're kind of going to wrap up here with the golden Scott fire where, um, we're north of we're between Scott Bar and um, Scott Valley on uh, the Scott River. These fires have been backing down the slope. We've been watching this for the last two weeks, really, of them backing slowly down the slope. Uh, n they're cooling off. Not really any spread to speak of on um, on the top here. These fires are, are have been pretty well wrapped on the top for almost a week, and so they're they're continuing to back down to the road here. And maybe they'll get a little help uh, as they get close, but those are looking pretty solid. And not really seeing much going on on the head fire at all. Um, a little bit of heat here on this kind of inaccessible part of the west side. This, uh, this side of the fire is burning up into a 2014 burn. And we see some scattered heat in um, the gap fire, gap fire burn in 2016. And just uh, flick that on and off so we can see, uh, like, no no new spread on that part of the fire outside of what was burned uh, over 24 hours ago. So there you go. Uh, that's our fires for this morning. I'll look at a couple... Um, um, if you, if you want to bomb my, my comments with, um, conspiracy or, um, wacky doodle shit, um, we're going to block you, um, truth seeker. Um, I'm going to look at a few comments. People are saying, well, there's ridiculously cool for August. Is there action to protect O'Brien? Yes, there is. Um, check out Rosiskew Facebook page, and um, I don't have specific information on that, but there's a whole team that's focused on the, the Oregon side of the Smith River complex. Um, James Mos Mosher says, or Mosher says they're expecting strong up canyon winds last night falling with thunderstorms. 80s and that in the next week. Um, glad it worked out. Um, did we got some rain on these things? And um, 
like I said before, if you got intel for us, if you um, spot things where we're getting it wrong, let us know. You can get a hold of us through the lookout.org. Um, and just want to say thanks to all the people who are supporting us. Um, if you want to get some lookout merch, stickers, hats, t-shirts, um, you can check out our lookout webpage or become a subscriber.